Welcome everyone to this edition of the Not So Common Podcast. I'm Pat Contry. I'm going solo this time. And the first podcast was solo, and there might be others in the future, depending upon my mood, if there's anyone I want to currently interview, what my schedule is like. Uh, but yeah, this was a busier schedule than usual. Um, I didn't have time to coordinate with uh, someone that I know or a YouTuber or someone's work I admire. So that's why you got me just giving my opinion and rambling for the next 30 to 45 minutes or so. But last week was busy, as I alluded to. I went to too many games in Pennsylvania on Saturday, Sunday, Friday, something like that. And that was fun. That was a good time. But I was also there earlier in the week to visit my parents. Uh, and, I, and I brought a, a special friend, uh, my special lady friend, who met them for the first time. So my parents used to live in New Jersey. They moved to Pennsylvania about a year and a half ago in the fall of 2015. It was funny because when they told me about it, it was within the span of about six weeks almost where they said, yeah, we're thinking about moving to Pennsylvania because that's where my sister lives now. So within six weeks it was, yeah, we're thinking about moving to the next phone call after that was just about literally, hey, we, we sold the house in like a day and we have a new place to move to. So we're gone. And I was like, wow, that's great. You know, it would have been nice to go back one final Thanksgiving or, or Christmas. And, um, you know, visit the house that had ghosts, which I talked about in the CU podcast. <laughs> you know, visit the house one last time, see where my kitty cats, my beloved kitty cats, Cuddles, Mocha, and Fajita are all buried in the yard. That would have been great. Uh, but, you know, life doesn't always move the way you wish or as quickly or slowly as you want. And sometimes, you know, you, you can't go backwards. You know, time time sort of uh, dictates what happens to your life more than you so sometimes, more than you so can do. Um but they went to Pennsylvania. I visited with my my lady friend. That's always good. That's always a nice, nice um, nice situation. But it did not go as awfully as I thought it would go. You know, you, you, you're always apprehensive. It's like, eh, will my parents like her? More importantly, will she not hate me because? that I have a family like this and she can't stand, you know, it's more about making sure that when, when you bring home uh, a girlfriend, boyfriend, what, you know, wife or husband to meet your, your family, the, the worst thing that could happen would probably be is that how they view you changes from before they met their family, your family and afterwards. Like that was my, that was actually my fear is that after seeing my, my family that she would think, worse of me somehow and I, and it's going to be hard to articulate why without getting into really personal history of how I was raised and how I currently view my family but that was that was a that was a fear but to her credit and one of the reasons why I, I'm with her and the fact that you know she she can see past that and I don't think her view of me has changed for the worse it might have actually been strengthened a little bit seeing the, some of the you know, seeing the situation there, um, and, and not that it's obviously, you know, the family dy dynamic changes from when you're in your mid thirties versus when you were seven, but there's still a semblance of, of, of how it was then. And, you know, the personalities of your parents don't change drastically from when they were in their thirties to their sixties, which they are now. Um, but you know, it turned out great. Uh, for the most part, it wasn't as horrible you know, as, as I thought it would be. <laughs> And it's always good to have that that home cooking and get to see my sister and her and her lovely husband. And uh, we we went to the Jersey Shore. My sister and my lady friend and I we went to the Jersey Shore. It was the first time I'd been back there since wow, uh, since 2012. And you can see that online. Go to Pat, you know Pat returns to the Jersey Shore. Look up that video on YouTube. It's probably in two parts. And that's a very important video, not just because I'm in it and, and you know, that's my ego talking now. Um, it's very important because it's, it's somewhat a historical, it's now a historical document, an archive of, you know, how the boardwalk was before two events happened uh, in the subsequent summers of 13 and 14, 2013, 2014. You had Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy, as it's more accurately known, that happened in 2013. And that didn't really destroy the boardwalk. It, it, it killed Seaside Heights Casino Pier, which is now half the length. 
there's the iconic picture of the, the you know the small roller coaster being in in the Atlantic. Uh, but it didn't really damage a lot of the boardwalk stands and arcades because 95% of that is on the street side of the boardwalk at the Jersey Shore, not on the beach side. So it didn't really get to that point. Uh, the Flashbacks Arcade, which was documented, documented in that Pat Returns to the Jersey Shore video, that's in Seaside Park. So that's south. So, so as the storm went south, it did not do as much damage versus Seaside Heights and Seaside Parks, which is south of Seaside Heights. But there still was some damage. The, fla- the, the pier was still hit there. Uh, and the Flashbacks Arcade, which I documented, and, and it was literally the best arcade left in New Jersey. You know, thirty uh, about 30 pinball machines. Uh, probably 80 to 90 arcade machines, mostly vintage, some very hard to find, like the the original Budweiser version of Tapper, an original uh, Space Invaders, beautiful cabinet. You had some, you know, I think you had a Nintendo VS uh, Super Mario Brothers cabinet. Go watch that video. It, it, it was really an outstanding arcade, not just saying that. And it was the only one really left of the boardwalk that had a majority of, of coin op games, uh, actual games you play versus the, the other board, uh, other boardwalk arcades at the time, mo- uh, mostly going towards redemption only games, you know, where you play skee ball or you get tickets with a, you know, there's, there's some game type, you know, video game type, uh, cabinets or, or devices where you get tickets or points you, and you trade in for your good old spider ring and your, you know, army men and, you know, you save up a hundred thousand points and cost you a hundred thousand dollars. You get a, you know, a crappy PS3. Um, that's what most of the boardwalk games were or driving games. Cause they make more money or, you know, shooting games like, uh, the aliens arcade game where it's, you know, two players with a machine gun or, uh, uh, time crisis four, for example. So, so that survived Superstorm Sandy. However, there was a bad fire a year afterwards in 2014 that devastated two blocks of Seaside Park. And that ruined everything. So I went back to Seaside Park and Seaside Heights. And I said to, said to my, my sister, I want to approach this from, from the, the south side of Seaside Park. Because traditionally as a kid... We would come in around Seaside Heights uh, Casino Pier, which is about, you know, 25% in of the boardwalk activities if you're if you're looking north to south. So we came in Seaside Park, Sawmill Pizza, which survived the fire in 2014, partially uh, because, well, partially it had an anti-fire deterrent system. It had sprinklers and it had, a, you know, water coming out. So that saved it. The other buildings didn't. So in Seaside Park, you, you had about... Two blocks of, unfortunately, they weren't just um, street side arcades. There was a street side arcade uh, that's now gone. Um, but there was also a bunch of shops and an expanded boardwalk that went out over the beach a little bit. About, I want to say, uh, you know, 100 feet, maybe 120 feet of shops that went out past where the, the traditionally where the boardwalk would end going going north it sort of cut in and out and then you had also then seaside park had its own amusements out over the beach and into the ocean a little bit you know you had your rides and, and games and things of that nature besides the, that flashbacks arcade which i mentioned and which also includes that light gun game which i featured in that pat returns to the jersey shore video so i i come there and it's fucking gone a restaurant that was next to that as well that was over the beach gone. It's like it never existed. They're just they're just building new stands and new restaurants. Finally, three years later, they're they're finally deciding what to build there. So you had a very good amount of uh, besides the arcade, which um, was irreplaceable. Besides that, you had you had an old carousel probably 70 years old, 60 years old, at least an old carousel, gone. That light gun game, gone. A, a, a very good restaurant, gone. I remember that the saltwater taffy place, gone. There was a regular arcade street side. I forget what it was called. It was, it was fairly nice. I remember it was air-conditioned, uh, one of the few arcades that was air-conditioned. Actually, there's a couple of arcades, both gone, because this is two blocks. Um, there was a stand, the, the Coors ice cream stand that started the fire, 
uh, allegedly there was some, allegedly, well, I think there was faulty wiring, and that's where the fire started, and that went back to the year before with, with Superstorm Sandy. That's gone, but they were building it because Coors Ice Cream like is like the, the ice cream mafia of the Jersey Shore, at least for Seaside Heights, Seaside Park, there's like five stands, there's like one every two blocks. Um, it's, it's, it's outstanding custard, soft serve ice cream. That aside, uh, <laughs> I, I shed a tear. I was crying seeing that. And I thought to myself that, who thought to myself I wasn't going to cry? Now, I knew I was going to at least shed a tear, but it was emotional. Nostalgic feeling, you know, your childhood memories, and, and, and just ob- obliterated, wiped the fuck out. Gone. Um, it, it was, I don't want to say like losing a loved one, but it, it, it was like seeing a part of your childhood just ripped from your soul. And, and part of that was, part of that was just for... Nostalgia is a little selfish because it only means something to you personally, so um, and not anyone else. You know, you have your nostalgic feeling is not anyone else's. So that meaning selfish, not in a bad way. It's just the reality of it. So I was crying selfishly, but I also was crying for that arcade for all those games that are gone. That's a you know arc, uh, arcade preservation. That that that. That Tapper arcade machine, the Budweiser version, there's not a, a, a huge amount of those left. I, I'd be surprised if there's like 300 left or 200 of those left in the world. Those were pulled and replaced with root beer Tapper. Because, yeah, probably not a good idea to have an arcade game peddling uh, beer and, and alcohol to minors, uh, basically, or advertising it. Same same why, why people were pissed about Spud McKenzie, a cute little dog mascot trying to sell beer, or uh, Joe, you know, Joe Camel, kind of a cartoon little thing selling. You know, you, know, you don't want to sell... Alcohol and cigarettes to minors in cute ways. Um, and Tapper's definitely a cute game. And one of the more underrated arcade games. So that aside, I shed a tear. And then, uh, you know, a full block of nothing then. Like, they're starting to rebuild Sawmill Pizza, which has really good big slices. It's famous for its big slices. They they, they expanded. They have, they have a much bigger restaurant. And they expanded in the wake, I guess, of, of the, the fire. Um, they have another little, like, uh, restaurant there. Then, you know, they're rebuilding on both sides, on both the uh, street side and the beach side of the boardwalk. You go a block up, and then um, there's absolutely fucking nothing. And it's just so weird to see because when you when you walk those, like, um, eight or nine blocks of the boardwalk, Seaside Heights and Seaside Park, maybe 12 blocks, it's between 10 and 12 blocks, there's so much stuff to see. You have the the, the, the games, the quote-unquote games of chance, the wheel games. And I'll get to that, but 90% of those are gone. But they, they still exist, and I had fun with that. The frog bog game, which I'll get into. You have that. You, you, you still have the – but you still have some of the trashy Jersey Shore um, uh, little shops selling, like, the Jersey Shore T-shirts and, and selling the, uh, the sweatshirts. And, you know, it, like, people bored in June are – what was the new one I saw? It was, like – it was June when I went there, so you know a couple of weeks ago. But people bored in June are like are glorious or some some garbage like that. You sell the salt water tap in candy stores there, and you do have the same arcades that survive. Uh, you know, Lucky Leo's Coin Castle Casino Pier Arcade and the three or four others that are still there. Uh, those have changed, by the way. Those I think I found like two actual arcade games that weren't um, that weren't re- redemption game themed. Or weren't uh, like a shooter, like like Time Crisis, or um, a racing game. And by the way, there's a new uh, new Nintendo racer. There's a sequel to uh, Cruising uh, Cruising World, Cruising USA, Cruising World, Cruising Exotica. There's Cruising. Uh, what the hell is it called? Um, I saw it in one arcade, and I didn't get the chance to play it. Uh, uh, cruising. Uh, let's see. What's it called? It's Cruising Cruising Blast. Just came out this year. There you go. Buy it on your Nintendo 64. No, um, so, I did get to play, okay, the, the, the horror of the the fire got outside. We walked up. We played some games. Got to play some skee-ball. Even that changed, though. It's like, the, the, there's like plastic hard balls now. It doesn't have the same feel as the hard wooden balls. My, uh, you know, it, but it's still ski ball, you know. It's that's a, that's a Jersey thing. Ski ball, it's fantastic. Ski ball, it's a, it's a fun time. Uh, you got you got to roll balls and roll them up a ramp into a hole, and get points for for useless shit to redeem it for. And that's my my sister had her her old uh, her old points, so we got some stuff there. Uh, my my my, my uh, lady friend got a spider ring. You gotta get a spider ring at least once in your life. 
I mean, I'll be 90 years old and still think that's cute and dumb just because when I, when I was four, I used to get them. You know, it's like the cheapest thing you can get uh, when you redeem at one of these arcades. You, you get the spider ring for like five points. It, it, that's like a, that's like a, like a cent of value, not even. There, it's just a plastic spider you put on your finger. It's cute. Uh, we did the frog bog. I did better than I thought. I got three out of 20 frogs. And if you've ever done frog bog, that's actually pretty damn good for frog bog. It's like 20. Fr- it used to be as we were kids, I think it was like five frogs for a dollar. And if you'd be lucky to get one out of five when you, when you did that now, it was like, I think it was like eight frogs for five bucks or 20 for 10. So I said, screw it. When's the last time I played frog bog? I don't know. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, my uncle gave me a shot at one and me failing miserably. So I played frog bog. If you don't know what frog bog is, you get, you get a, a slimy rubbery frog. You put it on a stand with, you get a mallet and you hit it to catapult the frog, uh, and you have to get them into rotating. There's like four rotating lily pads in water with one in the middle. And you get prizes. It, it's, you know, it's it's one of the only true games of chance on the boardwalk that isn't rigged in some way. It's not like the knocking down the milk bottles or the dart game. Which, I'll, which I'll, Let me explain the dart game to you real, on the board real quick. The, the, the Jersey Shore still hasn't lost its charm when you have the people yelling at you to play the games when you go by. So, you know, the traditional game at your local carnival would be pop balloons by throwing a dart. So my sister and my lady friend go up with me because he says, oh, we'll give you a free one. And that's They always give you a free one to try to lull you in or lure you in in order to, to spend money. So they get two darts and I get a dart. We all throw. They pop their balloons. My dart, I swear to God, I throw the dart. It bounces, the tip bounces off the balloon. Which just goes to show you that maybe these aren't all traditional games of chance. Maybe they're rigged some way. Because what I think what the guy did was he gave he gave uh, my sister and my lady friend true darts that were actually had sharp points. He gave me the rigged one by accident. He gave me the dart that he would have given me if I actually paid the play. I could not believe it bounced off a balloon. I, I could probably not repeat that with an actual real dart if I wanted to. It went doink and bounced off. So he gave me a dulled uh, tip, dart. And he, and he said, oh, I want you to stay around. So they walked away before me. I was willing to stick around and spend, you know, a few dollars because he said, oh, I'll count the, the one balloon, one or two balloons that are popped towards the prize. I'm like, yeah, okay, this is fun. They walked away before me. And as I was walking away, when I followed them, I noticed they were going. He said, oh, what a guy you are. I feel like saying, to him, hey, hey, asshole, I was going to stay. Even with the rigged dart that I knew you gave me. I was going to give it a try and just give you my money. But we went to Frog Bog. Uh, Frog Bog is a lot better. It's it's more traditional. It's in this almost the same exact spot it was uh, when we were kids. And I got three out of 20. And I got three little mini stuffed animals. I, I could have got one large, a, me, a medium size, or three mini ones. And I, I got some decent you know, ones for that. I actually hit my first one and got it on tape. And that was a great time. We had to get the, you know, sausage sandwich. Thank God we put that sausage sandwich three ways. Otherwise, we would have been hurting. We got some pizza. We got the Coors ice cream. We got the whole experience in. And it wasn't just empty, oh, let's relive our childhood. It was, it was for me at least more, let's see how the boardwalk stands up to how I remembered it last, traditionally, the last time it was traditional. Uh, you know, the, basically the same, for the most part, 95% the same boardwalk from when I first went in the mid 80s to 2013, 95% the same boardwalk. And now it's 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 vastly different. Um vastly different. And that's a shame uh to me, but you know life moves on and maybe it's a lesson. It's a, it was most it's you know it's it's like having a pet. You can have that pet for a part of your life, but eventually you know that the pet's going to pass away and you got to deal with it. It's not going to be the same feeling before and afterwards. Eh, and I guess, I, is that where I'm coming to? The Jersey Shore is a pet to me in some way? I eh, feel with the same fuzzy feelings and and uh, bad food. You know, chicken cheese steak. Had one of those. Those were fantastic. Um, Jersey Shore, if, I'm, I'm, it's hard to, to, to relay that experience because even, I know there's, I know there's like stuff near the beaches, Venice Beach, not the same. Uh, I can see how there's some similarities. Uh, PB, Pacific Beach, I live near here in San Diego. Not the same. They don't have the same cheesy games of, of quote-unquote skill. Now, there are games of chance left, though, at the Jersey Shore, which somehow are legal. You are gambling money 
on games of chance with with the big spinning arrow going around. You put your quarter or now dollars or two dollars or three dollars down, and you select spaces on a wheel the, um, for a wheel, and then the arrow goes around. You click the button to make it go. Click a button to make it stop. Totally, totally, quote unquote, chance. Um, not really regulated by the state. That's probably a whole thing about. I can get into how the state of New Jersey is corrupt. That's that's what's one of the most corrupt states in the U.S. Probably the top four, along with Illinois. I think Illinois is probably still the, the worst, but New Jersey's probably in top three or four. Um, and so we did a game of chance. I won there. I won a nice stuff pack, man, on the first try. Because you know what? Those crane games are now rigged. Those are no longer chance. Those are not. Those are not chance. That's I think those are based now on the more money you put in, the tighter the grip gets until the machine realizes that you won. And then it goes back to a loose grip. Grip. So I picked up there's there's these cute stuff Pac-Mans now that are licensed, and they have like a, a, a yellow Pac-Man. They have all four colored ghosts. They have like a red Pac-Man, a Miss Pac-Man, and they have um like the scaredy ghost when 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 Pac-Man gets the power pellet. So I wanted that one. I wanted the blue scared ghost, Pac-Man ghost. So I played a game. I lifted that 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 sucker up three times. These are like dollar shots. Lifted that sucker up three times, and it actually went over a little bit towards where it drops it into the hole. So you win it, and it would drop it like just randomly. Now, this is fucked up. So then we played a wheel game, and we won it. I was like, it was like uh, like three bucks for for five spaces or something on the wheel. We won in the first uh, first try. It was like a one in five chance of winning. So there you go. I got my my pack, man. Um, and I'm happy for it. I'm a better person for having more stuffed animals being in your, in your thirties. Yeah, why not? Then I went to too many games, and that's always fun. Always, uh, it's always good to meet people there, and um, very, but it's very exhausting. This is why I'm here now, coming circle to to after I'm rambling about my parents and going to the Jersey Shore. You come for, full circle to this, to me being back at doing a podcast later than I usually am because. I was at my booth for three days and, you know, talked to at least a couple hundred people. I don't know. It's hard to count. And you take pictures and you, you know, you, you talk to people and everyone's nice. There's, there's usually not a problem at these events. The only problems potentially are the people that are there that are other invited guests or have boots that, you know, they don't like you. Um, and you have to deal with them. But thankfully that one person, uh, didn't try to slime his way into a conversation with me this time and just sat there. Um, and just just glared at me. A person that it might it might come up in the future. Uh, I know there's always people say like Ian is wanting me to you know he doesn't like the drama, but there's people that there's people that attack me behind the scenes. People that I'm very civil to, and I want to make it clear that that you don't have to be nice to everyone, but you have to be civil. And I'm very civil to everyone I, I go to at these events. And you know, you, and it, 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 when you have a bunch of YouTubers and egos thrown together, you're bound not to get along with everyone. Not to be everyone's favorite person and, and vice versa. And that's fine. We're adults. We can deal with that. But I'm always very civil to people as long as they're civil to me. And that's what happens with this individual at these events. Even though he spreads lies about me behind the scenes and collaborates and speaks to a human piece of garbage uh, on YouTube that none of us like. And that might come up in the future as well. Someone that's attacked me. And uh, basically slandered and libeled of me, and has promoted piracy of my book, a, a human piece of, of, of trash. Um, so that's always fun when you know someone talks to them, and you have to see that person. Guilt by association. You are judged by. This is a life lesson right now. You are judged by who you associate with. That goes for everyone, and especially with us YouTubers. So anyway, moving on from that, I'm here. So. <laughs> Let's talk about some uh, some hashtag not so common podcast uh, topics. I'll try to get, go through some of these before I, you know, go grab a burrito or something. So uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, da, 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 da. Reflections. This is from at, and I'll probably do this on some of the future not so common podcasts where it's just me and, and not a guest. Uh, but yeah, you can leave hashtag not so common. And then I can see on Twitter what you want me to discuss. Here we go. This is from uh, Andy Darmacle. Reflections on all Spider-Man movies leading up to your expectations of Spider-Man Homecoming. Would you predict it is a hit? Yeah, this is going to be a hit. I mean, Rotten Tomatoes already has it as like a 9.2 out of 10. Um, I love when I hear people describe this. And, and the writer and director describe this as a John Hughes movie. 
masquerading as a Spider-Man movie. That's fantastic because that's what the original uh, Ditko and Stan Lee comics from the early 60s were. High school drama, Peter not barely getting by with responsibilities to his Aunt May and then doing his high school work and being picked on by Flash Thompson and being ignored by Liz Allen and just just suffering as as he was he was a geek, he was a nerd, he was socially awkward before he got bit by that spider. And that was the appeal to me as as a kid because I was a, a geek, I was quote unquote a nerd, at least I was socially awkward for for probably until college, for the most part, I couldn't talk to girls. I did have friends, but that sometimes I had to work very hard at. Um, but I did, I did have friends. I could get along with 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 a lot of people, but it still didn't mean it was easy to do that. I had to, I had to work at it. And but that's why I love love Spider Man because it, it's the escape of being a superhero, uh, the confidence of being strong and being able to lift a car and having the quips and you know. Uh, you know, being a smart ass to your enemies, which is an outlet to Peter being bullied and not being able to be socially accepted on the one side. But that's why it's so appealing is that there was no superhero like that before Spider-Man where, wow, this guy is just a loser in his real life. At least that's how people uh, look at him. And he can't, he can't get by. He's not a rich guy like Batman or Iron Man. He's not a God like Wonder Woman or Superman. He's just a dorky teenager. And they try to capture that feeling in the Sam Raimi movies to an extent, but in those in the Sam Raimi trilogy, Peter is out of high school within the first like forty minutes of the of the first film, and in the comic books, he was in high school until issue twenty eight, two and a half years, and that that's that's integral to his to his personality and to Peter's character is the high school years, the formative years. So I'm glad that there's at least one movie. There should be at least two, if not a whole trilogy, where he's in high school. But at least this, this first movie, he's back in high school. I'm, I'm, and I'm glad to see Sony work it out with Marvel in order to do this, make this a reality. Because um, Sam Raimi, he got Spider-Man, kind of. He was supposedly an old-school Spider-Man fan, which is so weird that why uh, how uh, Spider-Man didn't have mechanical web shooters in the, that tr- uh, Raimi tr- trilogy. It was written in, they filmed it, but they decided against it. They thought it would be too complicated to explain or whatever, which huge mistake because part of Peter's personality, which is why I love how he's introduced in, in Civil War, is that he's a technical genius for being someone that young. So that, yeah, he could figure out potentially how to make the web shooters, um, and especially since he's bitten by the spider, that gave him sort of an, an intuition. And I'm glad they brought the, that, that aspect back for the Andrew Garfield uh, portions of the, uh, the Andrew Gar- Garfield, I guess, not trilogy, I don't know, uh, dual films, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man films uh, that came out in, what, 2012 and uh, 2014. But those f- films missed the mark. The Andrew Garfield ones missed the mark because while I love the portrayal of, uh, portrayal of the wise-ass Spider-Man in there, I don't think Garfield's portrayal of Peter w- hit the mark at all. He wasn't... He, they changed him from sort of socially awkward and to like kind of a jerk. He had to like kind of a jerk once he got the powers. There was that scene with Flash Thompson there where like he dunked on him, which was insane because he dunked like by jumping 30 feet. And you think at that point... Oh, the jig is up. People know you have superpowers. And yeah, he was just sort of a just a loner jerk in that movie versus being a socially awkward geek like he's supposed to be portrayed and how he was portrayed for the most part in the Raimi films, um, at least for that first film. By the second and third films, uh, they kind of got away from that a little bit. They just made him sort of a weirdo. I think I think Raimi did understand the difference between being a weirdo that doesn't know how to you know, act with towards anyone versus being just socially unaccepted because you're just a geek. Uh, so I'm glad to see this come back. So no, I am very excited, and I think it's going to make a ton of money. Uh, that Spider-Man Two movie, Amazing Spider-Man Two, did not make that much. One of the reasons why now it's coming back. Um, Sony decided to take the good gamble and co-produce with Marvel. This is from at Gray Fox three nine three. Your story with weight loss and working out. Anytime you have mentioned it, I always want more details. Well, I was out of shape for for a majority of my childhood and teenage years. I was probably really out of shape from Jesus Christ. 
The NES didn't help when that came out in 87. That's when I got in 87, that's for sure. That didn't help. Is that a shape from, let's just say, phew, ages 7 or 8? We'll just say I was out of shape from ages 7 to 20. I was out of shape. Um, growing up in a, in a household where your mom makes lasagna and spaghetti and meatballs. And let's just say not the healthiest food to eat when you're a kid. Chicken Parmesan, you're eating this stuff like three times a week. <laughs> not just that, you don't have good, uh, you weren't brought up with good, um, any sort of discipline for how much sweets you should be eating. So bless my mom, she would make, we come home from school, there'd be fresh Toll House cookies, you know, or freshly baked cookies or brownies. So we come home, you know, and this is like three, by three o'clock. You're eating fucking brownies or cookies, and then only two, two and a half hours later, you're having dinner. And then eating a good amount, and you're not really exercising it off that much. Now, I did go outside as a kid, and I did uh, play. I did, you know, play like flag football, not flag football, two-hand touch football in the streets. I played street hockey. I I, I was in Little League in the spring, even though when, you're, when you play baseball, you don't move that much. <laughs> it's, it's hard to lose weight playing uh, baseball. Too bad it wasn't like soccer. You actually move a little bit. So I was out of shape. And then you combine that with you know playing video games a lot as you go to towards your teenage years and and um, a lot of computer games. Civilization two didn't help in high school. That certainly didn't help. And and you and you gain a lot of weight. And you know um, there was no incentive for me to lose weight. I guess just because I didn't play the sports that would require it that much. And I guess when I played street hockey, I, I, I had enough energy to do it. Um, but like if I was, yeah, if I was playing like basketball or soccer, forget it. If I ran, or if I ran uh, track in high school, you know, um, it would have it would have been an incentive to get in the shape. Or if I went to, you know, if I was around girls a lot in high school, that would have been an incentive to get into shape, uh, to get get chubby pat into shape. So college comes, and I'm not I'm not talking about like me being like I wasn't like 80 pounds overweight. It was more like probably 30 to 40, uh, probably 40 pounds overweight, 40 to 50. But it got worse in college because I tore my ACL playing intramural basketball, and I always liked playing basketball. I was never great just because hey I was not I'm not tall enough for basketball. I'm under six feet, and then plus I don't have the biggest hands. You need big hands in order to properly uh, dribble well in order to shoot well. Uh, it's always better to have bigger hands, but I always could rebound well. I played defense well. Uh, so I played intramural basketball and I tore my ACL. That was the end of freshman year. And then I had the surgery that summer. I did rehab it hard. I did do that. And the, the guy said I was one of the quickest recoveries he saw. Um, and you know, but it was hard to get back into it in terms of running a lot. I had cartilage damage, had to basically smooth itself out. So that sophomore year in college, I let myself go, go more than usual. And I probably put on another 25 pounds, and I was probably at like 230, something like that, 225, 230, second year of, of college. And right now, I, I'm now, we'll just let you know, I'm like 175 with some muscle tone. So we're talking about a 50-pound difference here, and I did not have the muscle tone I had sophomore year of college versus now. Um so it, it came to a head just because I just didn't feel right. And I knew I had to lose weight, but I was still in denial about it. It just wasn't, I wasn't healthy. I wasn't eating healthy, but I just, I just wasn't exercising enough. And, and the knee injury was, I, I, I think I made an excuse. Uh, yes, my knee did hurt, but I had to work through it in order to get to a place where I can actually, you know, try to be a little bit healthier and be, yes, be attracted to the opposite sex. That would help. Because it is a, it is somewhat of a myth that that um, I, I grew up thinking that women valued physical fitness and appearance a lot less than men, and that's just that's just not true. They they value it probably it may not be to the same extent as men, but it's still very highly valued. And oh boy, I learned that when I came back from the summer when I was actually in decent shape. But we'll get into that in another podcast. But anyway, so that summer. What I did to get in the shape is I basically took the route of let's just do the simplest route possible. So I used to drink a lot of like sodas and, and sugary drinks and lemonades and fucking high C and garbage that no kid should be drinking. Corn syrup, garbage, iced tea. 
I cut all that shit out. I just said it, it's what you call empty calories, liquid calories. There's no health benefit at all to drinking iced tea or lemonade or, or you know, Coca-Cola. There's no benefit at all uh, to that. It doesn't help you. So why not just switch to water? Why not just do that? Or Diet Coke when you go out to drink. Uh, go out to drink or go out to eat. Why not just do that? Now people say, oh, all the shit and, and diet sodas harmful to you. Can't be as bad as drinking, you know, 64 ounces of... Of a, of a Pepsi when you're at TGI Fridays. Because that's what I used to do. I used to get like the free refills. So I get a burger. Uh, this is like me when I'm 17. I go out to eat at TGI Fridays. I love that fucking place. I get mozzarella sticks for an appetizer. Yeah, that's healthy. But then I also get like a burger. And I get like the Oreo Madness for dessert. A, a, a really, really great three-course meal. That's fantastic. But... The worst part about that would be probably, honestly, the soda. I would drink probably four to five glasses of, of non-diet soda, of, of Coke or Pepsi. That's a ton of extra wasted calories. So I figured, I'm smart enough to realize that if I at least do that, I'll lose weight. And I and I and So I cut out the sodas and sugary drinks. But I also then started to cut out carbs to the extent. I always, you know, the, back when I did this, it was, you know, Ak- Atkins diet was getting more more popular, which is, which is more carbs and less, less bad, excuse me, more more carbs. Yeah. Carbo load. No more protein, less carbs and bad carbs. Like, uh, you know, uh, pasta, less starches, uh, less potatoes, stuff like that. So that's what I did. And damn it, it worked just changing my diet and getting rid of some of the crap. I get rid of some of the chocolate and the sweets. I kept a little bit of it, but, um, it worked. And then I started to run I ran like every other day and it was painful. I'm not going to say that when you are so out of shape for a long time that getting into better shape is easy. No, it's not easy, but nothing, what's the, the dumb uh, dumb expression? Nothing easy is worth doing. There, there's something to be said for that or else everyone would have done the easy thing already, right? So it was hell on earth the first, I say two to three weeks running every every other day. And because your lungs, when your lungs aren't used to uh, air coming in and out and the blood's not used to circulating through those lungs because you're not ever working them. It's like your chest is on fire when you when you try to even jog two blocks. And that's what it was. Had to stop and go, stop and go. And I was just only running like, trying to run like probably two to three miles. You know, run for like 45 minutes, run for an hour, run around my neighborhood. And that's what I did during that summer. I had a job, I only worked I think like 20 hours a week that summer. That's a whole other podcast conversation too. But I, I ran and... It was difficult. So for the first month, it's like, yeah, you, you may not feel better for the first. I definitely didn't feel better for the first two weeks. But by that, I say third week, it kicked in where all of a sudden, wow, I can get more air into my body. This is becoming easier. There is that sort of like hump you get over or you're like, oh, my God, this is how a human should uh, be able to to operate and exercise physically, to be able to run a half mile without thinking you're going to fucking die. And I reached that point, and then I guess that's with exercise in general, or or um, feeling better about yourself and and finding your groove is that your body chemistry when it slowly changes, your metabolism slowly changes, it just becomes gradually easier and easier. Then you reach a point where it becomes a lot easier to function versus how you were functioning on uh, being unhealthy before. And that's what I reached. I, like I remember that Fourth of July, I'd been home from from um, college at that point for like probably. S- Let's see, you get out of college a lot earlier, probably by mid-May, you're home. So by six to seven weeks, we'll just say, I've I've begun running by that point and eating probably better, not super healthy, but better. Cutting out the sugary drinks and bullshit, not eating French fries anymore. I think that's one thing I definitely said, I'm going to cut out French fries. I knew that was a a horrible thing to eat. Um, So I cut that out. Then I, I learned, though, that I couldn't just eat as much as I could before. So I was... From, I would say, fucking 12 years old, old, I was able to eat at a barbecue easily. At least two burgers, a hot dog, and, you know, and potato salad, macaroni salad, coleslaw, tons of sides, corn on the cob, no problem. Now I'm starving thinking about it. I was the worst possible thing I could have done on the podcast right now was, was, was get, clean myself up, do a podcast, and not fucking eat a snack. Because I'm starving right now thinking about this. But when I was, let's see, I started getting into shape now that was, okay, 20 years old. I said I remember the Fourth of July barbecue with my uncle there, my cousin, my sister, my family. I could eat barely, like barely. I'm talking; it almost hurt to eat one hamburger and like a hot dog. 
So I was eating roughly half the amount of food that, that, that I probably could have eaten versus the year before. Just because I was retraining my body and myself how to eat, and my body caught on, and my stomach started to shrink. And all of a sudden, and even mentally, my body was able to eat or easily tell myself, maybe you ate enough food. You don't need to eat fucking two hot dogs and two burgers and tons of sides. You're fine right now. So that was like an epiphany. My body was like, holy shit, Pat. You must have been abusing yourself the past like 15 years. And I was. It's just that my body didn't know it. Because when you have a larger stomach, it's harder to get full. you know. And now my stomach was shrinking. I was exercising more. Plus, I was burning more calories. That's, that's the important thing. It's, it's so much easier easier to lose weight when you, when you move and burn calories. Diet alone, diet's, diet's extremely important. Diet's like probably 60 to 70%. But you do need that 30 to 40 percent of exercise to actually burn those calories if you want to lose weight quicker and actually change how your body functions. That's that that cannot be denied. It, you cannot really have one without the other easily, diet and exercise. But I hate the word diet because that, that implies that you're just drinking freaking slim fast and eating vegetables only. No, I, I mean eat, let's just say eating better, or eating right, and exercise. Anyway, so that's the story of how I started to get into shape. And I wasn't in the greatest shape that summer, but I, I came back from from this that summer between sophomore and junior college, and I lost just by eating better, not eating necessarily healthy, but just eating better, and not abusing myself by drinking you know five glasses of fucking soda at TGI Fridays, um, just by eating better and running a little bit and doing push-ups. And I may say run, I mean jog, but and doing some push-ups and just little things. I I dropped like. Jesus Christ, but probably, uh, let's see, I came back to college probably 185, easily 30 to 35 pounds in about three months I dropped. And I came back to college and people were like, wow, Pat, you look different. You look better. And I was like, yeah, and I feel a little bit better too. And I got a confidence boost and that goes with that too. You get that confidence boost too. So I'm not sure if this is supposed to be Pat's talk about, you know, life coaching hour or question from here, but um, that's, that's what, uh, that's how it started. And and now I go to the gym like three or four days a week. I do. I've been do, doing yoga for ten years, and it, it it's it's you have to want it. Is what I'm going to say. Is that everyone's busy, but you have to make it a priority like anything else. If it's important enough to you, if you're not happy with how your body is or your health, um, just make it a smaller priority versus something else. And some time has to come away from something else. Obviously, maybe it's you know you don't watch Netflix for a half hour that day. Instead, you go to the gym for a half hour or work out off a YouTube video or go for a jog for a half hour. But you can make it happen. That's Pat's motivational answer of the week, week, week. Uh, this is from a really, uh, real, uh, real Kentucky nerd or KentuckyNerd.com. I can't remember if you follow UFC at all, but Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather. You think McGregor can lay him out? No, no, I don't think he can lay him out. Conor McGregor, uh, the biggest UFC star. He rose, huge rise to prominence in three years. Uh, he's a great fighter, great for the sport. He's a loud mouth. He, he, he talks well. He's, you know, Irishman. Um, he, he fights at, wow, 155. He tries to get down to 145, but it looks like Skeletor and he tries to do that. He's really like a 155 fighter. Um, he's, he's, found, he's been the best thing for the sport, especially since Ronda Rousey is now gone. Uh, she was the biggest in the sport for probably two or three years along with John Jones and, and maybe Evangelay Silva. Uh, but... You have now Floyd Mayweather, one of the best boxers of all time, 49 and 0 professionally. No one can deny that. Uh, you may not like the way he fights, which is defensive, uh, but there's an art to it, and there's a, a huge skill involved with learning to box. He's 40 years old. McGregor's, like, I think, 29. So there's an age difference there. 40's old for a boxer, but not ancient, believe it or not. You can still have, have success that old, if, as long as you keep you know, take care of yourself and don't get hit a lot. And, and Mayweather has not been hit a lot because he's such a great defensive boxer. So McGregor, McGregor has a, has a what's it called, a, a punching chance. He can always just tag Mayweather, but Mayweather doesn't get tagged by professional boxers that are just as strong, if not stronger, than McGregor and have actual boxing experience for, you know, 20, for 15, 20 years, like the Canelo fight. That's a guy just as strong as May, uh, McGregor, if not stronger, and he couldn't lay a finger on uh, Mayweather at all. So I think Mayweather takes this fight. I'm going to be watching it just for the, the uh, it's going to be the biggest, it's the biggest fight in boxing or UFC in the past, probably 
15 years at least. It's probably Holyfield Tyson or or, or Tyson uh, Lewis in the late 90s. I remember watching that over at someone's house and buying the pay-per-view for that. Um, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun time. I think Mayweather takes it. I don't know if Mayweather knocks him out, but he's, he's definitely going to win easily uh, there because boxing and MMA are two different things. Talk about, this is from that Critical Assault. Talk about the couple that tried to get famous by trying to stop a bullet with a book. Needless to say, it did not end well. Holy shit, what a, what a fucked up story. You, you didn't think that Darwin's Law would really apply to people trying to gain internet fame, but it has here. So this is a, a this was a teenage YouTubers, uh, a 19 year old. This is a NBC News, and you have New York Times. Uh, stunt turns deadly for a couple seeking YouTube fame. So the, the 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 YouTube channel was Mona Lisa. Was it Mona Lisa Perez? What is it? Mona Lisa. Let me look this up. Mona Lisa Perez. Uh, da, da, da. It's La Mona Lisa. They do stunts. Clean. That's her talking. In my daily routine. The last video was posted June 26th, and now she's she's being booked for fucking manslaughter for killing her boyfriend. Doing scary stunts at the fair, part one. Uh, eight and three thousand followers. They probably had a lot less at, before the story broke. This video has. Uh, this is the last video they put up. This is not the one showing the death. That's not going to be put out on YouTube, probably. Uh, this has 759,000 views, mostly downvoted. And of course, you have people saying. I just subbed. Can't wait for the next video. Ha, ha, ha. Yes, because there won't be any more. Why don't they upload? What the fuck? I came here for the comments, and God damn it, you guys didn't disappoint. Man, YouTube comments are fucking vicious. Sometimes they're funny, but overall, they're just vicious. So, so the, the, I guess this YouTuber, uh, Pedro Ruiz the third, 22 years old, uh, and Mona Lisa Perez, 19. And she's, she was pregnant, by the way. Well, and I think they already had a kid. Uh, but she was definitely pregnant, according to the story. And the story is that uh, Pedro Ruiz asked uh, his wife, Mona Lisa, to shoot him in the chest with a handgun while he's holding a book to stop the bullet. And this was for a stunt that they would post on YouTube. Yeah, this sounds safe. And by the way, this wasn't just any old handgun. A fucking Desert Eagle 50 caliber handgun. Caliber, if you don't know that, 50.5 means half an inch. So 9 millimeter is the size of it, 0.4 inches. This this thing is half, this bullet is like, like, let's see. It's like the size of half your fucking finger, the bullet when you see it. So this would have been dangerous with a 22 caliber, or, or which, you know, one of the smallest caliber handgun. A 50 caliber handgun is is almost instant death. Like I mean, Like, no chance of surviving this. So what's funny about this to me? Well, it's funny that it's not. Well, it's a tragedy, obviously, that uh, these are two fucking idiots that wanted YouTube fame. They, you risk your life for YouTube fame, and obviously this isn't new. You got that fucking daredevil idiot that used to jump off of like buildings into pools, and um, we always talked that. Me and Ian almost talked about it in the CEO podcast. He jumped off of a hotel roof. And he barely got into the pool, but like he smashed up his feet and ankles. Ankles, and next thing you know, this idiot has like a GoFundMe to raise money for his um, to fix his feet, which are just destroyed. Uh, and it's sort of like, dude, you knew the risks. You knew eventually you're gonna you're gonna get caught by not being able to do a dumb stunt like this. But this is where we are, where anyone can be famous on the internet. It's not like being famous in the movies or TV or or, or radio, having a radio show, being a being a TV star, being an author. You know, being a, an actor, stage, or film, where you actually needed skill to get noticed and to get your notoriety and to be, become famous. Now, anyone with an iPhone and a stupid idea become famous. And now these two are infamous. And one's dead. So they're from Minnesota. Um, the sheriff said, I really have no idea what they were thinking. I just don't understand the younger generation on trying to get their 15 minutes of fame. Well, every generation tries to get their 15 minutes of fame. It's just that it's so much fucking easier now because of YouTube to do so. It's so much easier. And then with the meme generation, uh, with Twitter, anyone can become even famous on Twitter for, you know, having a funny meme or picture that gets reposted or retweeted or liked 15,000 times or 5,000 times. And now, oh, wow, I'm famous now. I, I, I got made. And But with YouTube, it's easier. It's just a shock. 
what's ironic about this, and I'm hoping to use the term irony correct, correctly because most of the time people don't do that, is that if they had just Googled or went online and said, you know, 50 caliber paper, you know, stop bullet or whatever. Someone tried it a couple of years ago. Like there's, there's just YouTube channels with people that fire guns off and shows how, you know, what they think how cool the guns are. And guns can be cool if they use responsibly. Obviously they're not here. But they tested this with a, uh, a 50 caliber rifle. Uh, no, 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 it wasn't a rifle. I'm sorry. It was a 50 caliber handgun, not a Desert Eagle. I think it was a, I think it was a huge like six shot revolver, Smith and Wesson. They used reams of paper. Obviously, they weren't dumb enough to put them against her body, but they lined up like uh, reams of, of printer paper, and a ream usually has about 500 pages each. And they shot it with a 22, and the 22 I think did not go through the first ream of paper. But then they shot it with a 50 caliber handgun, and the bullet passed through the first two reams of paper. Picture two reams of internet of internet paper of, of printer paper. A thousand sheets of paper. That's pretty fucking thick. That's thicker than probably 99% of books. It went through two reams and then stopped at the start of the third ream of paper. Okay? So obviously, 50 caliber bullet and handgun pa packs a freaking wallop. If they had YouTubed that, they probably would not have done this experiment, this, this awful experiment. But in this one article, it says that they, they tested it with a book, book beforehand, at least Pedro did, and that was a way for him to convince uh, convince his his wife or girlfriend, Mona Lisa, in order to try it out. And, and according to the reports, what she said is that um, she begged him to try this. Or excuse me, he begged her. He begged her. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not reading this correctly. He begged her to try this and persuade her, and she finally did it, and now... Uh, his life is gone. Her life is ruined. She's going to go to prison probably for it's involuntary manslaughter. I don't know how it's not voluntary. Um, uh, looks like, but you know, she'll be out of jail probably five to seven years with probation and her life's fucking ruined from this. Um, and, and horrifically, you, you know, you kill this person you love and you're, and you're pregnant with their kid. The mugshot, when you see her, it's just like, oh my God, I can't believe this. They're at least around second degree manslaughter. There you go. Is it involuntary or voluntary? Well, let's see. That's a big difference in, in, let's see, manslaughter. Let's see. Second degree manslaughter. Oh, I think it's voluntary. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, she's going to be doing prison time. She's going to plead guilty and get some prison time. There you have it. Seeking YouTube fame. It's funny. They thought they would get famous from, from doing prank videos. And, um, yeah. Mr. Ruiz had been trying to get her to fire the gun for a while, Miss Perez told investigators, according to court documents. They state that he had set up one camera on the back of a vehicle and another on a ladder to capture the stunt. Fantastic. Good job, guys. Good fucking job. Jesus, I feel worse of all for the, for the unborn kid. And I think the other kid I saw in one of their videos that they had uh, put on there. Just, just awfulness. God, like, when you see a story like this, you think that things cannot get worse for humanity, that that we've reached the level of, all right, we can't be this stupid, can we? No, but we're, we are this stupid sometimes. As a collective, we are. As a collective, we, we are definitely that stupid. Uh, and we are only as good as the worst of us. That's the, 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 the age-old expression, right? Um, this is from at Calman. How do you respond to people who demand a faster rate of content creation? Uh, I ignore them <laughs> because it uh, because you, when you create content online, people become accustomed to it. It's like now a habit. It's a part of their life to see. It. It's not like waiting a year for a Netflix show or two to three years for a movie. They want it now, 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 now because they see other content getting put out so quickly. You just have to ignore it and move on. I mean, you can't bow to their whims. They're not living your life. You're living your own life. Um, let's see. And finally... Da, 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 da. Not fun. Ah, a couple more. Okay, this is Sargon of Akkad, who's a YouTuber. Is he in hashtags? Is from 8-Bit Ghost. Is Sargon of Akkad in hashtag Cuban garbage, or is Anita Sarkeesian a quote in hashtag professional victim? Is Sargon a human garbage, or is Anita Sarkeesian a professional victim? All right, this story is. Oh, this question comes because because of uh, I think uh, VidCon, which is a big YouTuber. Uh, convention it was in la this past weekend i always want to go but it's usually during too many games she had a panel about i think it was like women in, in game women in gaming 
So uh, Sargon of Akkad has been a huge critic of her, and, and he rose to prominence with Gamergate and, and through criticizing her. Um, he was on Joe Rogan's podcast, and Joe Rogan encapsulated what I thought brilliantly because he basically told her, like, is it enough enough talking about her? But they have the, there's a symbiotic relationship going on here between these two people. Nina Sarkeesian does the uh, feminist frequency videos trying to highlight what's wrong with uh, video game tropes and sexism in games and games m causing or leading to misogyny and sexism. And I don't agree with her arguments by far. I think her work is interesting in and of itself. They are good, let's just say, good starting points for conversations. They don't really get into the nitty-gritty of culture as much as you'd want. They don't lay out any real arguments for how the industry is at that point or or if the industry really has a problem with sexism in terms of the consumer base and do they drive it um, or or is, is the or is the consumer base just dictating the market or is the market dictating what the games are it's more again it's more like a it's more like her videos for better or for worse are a beginning paragraph of a high school paper that don't really get into where we go from there they don't lead to any other argument they're not they don't it, it, they they are they are more of a or more of a, a a inclusive argument not really open to discussion with others that's the issue i have with her work um and and obviously she's she's been a target uh, of harassment um bomb threats death threats etc cetera, etc cetera. And so uh, the Sargon of Akkad, I think, went. He had like a group that there's videos out there. I'm not gonna get into the weeds on this, but they they they, they went to her panel on purpose to sit in the in the in like the first three rows of I think like the the left section, stage left, um, or excuse me, stage right. She knew she knew the group was there, um, and so she called him human. Uh, she called him garbage at VidCon because she said, well, you have to deal with harassment and look, there's someone right here who, who does videos about me and harasses me. I'm paraphrasing here. And she called them garbage. Um, Joe Rogan, I think he, he brought up to Sargon, uh, whose real name is, what, what's his real fucking name? I don't like calling people on the internet by their avatars too much. I think it's kind of childish. They're real people, especially when it gets into the mainstream. This, his name is Carl Benjamin. He's an English YouTube commentator. He has his own Wikipedia page. I don't. I'm not important enough, but but he has he has one. All right. So he's an anti-feminist. Um, he's a self-proclaimed classic liberal. That's a whole other conversation I won't get into right now. Uh, but he got called garbage at the event. Uh, he he's been railing about. Well, that I've been I've now been uh, you know targeted i've been you know vidcon should throw her out because they went she went against the codes of, of conduct of of harassment of me and it's like holy shit dude just just fucking just make out already both of you you realize that both you are two sides of the same coin when it comes to feeding off of each other if, if someone like Ar anita sarkeesian did not exist uh carl benjamin's career would not be nearly at the heights it was now he told joe rogan that he's done 30 30 videos with Anita Sarkeesian as a target. 30! And Rogan was like, you don't you don't think that's a lot of videos? And Carl Carl replied, no, I don't think that's a lot of videos. That's a ton of fucking videos to do about one person in only a, a few years. That's a ton of fucking videos. Holy shit, dude, move on to something else. You're not getting anywhere. There's no conversation to be had between you and her. Because of you, you, you have, uh, I don't agree, here's the thing. Uh, Carl has said that yes, I don't, I don't, um, I don't agree with harassment. You shouldn't do that. Of course not. But the fact that you do thirty videos about someone means that you are by de facto the standard bearer for people that dislike her, and, and not just her work, her personally. You are the standard bearer, whether you want to admit it or not. So because of that, now she sees you, rightly or wrongly. As someone who's harassing her, because she has to deal with death threats, being doxxed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are real things that, that have happened. They've had to cancel her her showing up at events because of this. So for her to say to you that you are garbage and for you, uh, Sargon, to get a, that offended, I would say just fucking suck it up. 
I mean, I don't know how you expected her to respond to seeing you, not just you, but like you with a cadre of your followers and like-minded individuals getting off on the fact that you are there. And you say, yeah, we're just there to have a conversation and talk. And that's such fucking bullshit just because you don't go to someone's panel to start a conversation. If you wanted to try to talk to her, you know, backstage or, or say, hey, listen, we've had our differences. I just want to talk about it privately. But by trying to waylay her, her panel and... And just to sit there, and you can say, oh, we weren't there to intimidate her. I don't know how you re- would expect a reasonable person to do that. To, 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 I don't think, I don't know how you'd expect a reasonable person to react to that. If I went to, if I did a panel, I've done panels, and there were like three rows of YouTubers that I know have talked shit about me in the past or publicly, and their followers were there too. And sitting in the front three rows, I would have I would have done the same thing. I would have called you garbage, and I would have asked you to be kicked the fuck out. That's within my right as someone running the panel. So woe is you for being called human garbage. Get over it. Get over it, and then you you both can make out with each other because both of your uh, both of your careers are stronger for each other because uh, she gets to highlight at events like at this like people like you and your followers exist she gets to highlight that 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 that's the bullshit she puts up with and she does uh put up with shit like that you have to admit you can say that you don't cause it directly but eh, there's a contribution there indirectly there is you do 30 videos about someone uh what, what the fuck do you expect's gonna happen from your hundreds of thousands of followers what do you think's gonna happen on twitter and social media you can't you can't wash your hands of all of it you can wash your hands of the of of the particulars of of certain asshole individuals doing things, but you cannot wash your hands of the of the tone of the movement that you are a part of. You cannot wash your hands totally of 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 those that may not be able to separate what really fucking matters in life versus uh, thirty videos about someone's inconsequential. And I mean really fucking inconsequential feminist frequency uh, video series. If you didn't highlight her uh, constantly and people like you highlighting her work and leading to her getting her ass more. Like if you had done like even one or two videos and, 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 were, and was fucking done with it like you should have been. She wouldn't have probably even a third of the prominence she has now because of you. So you've helped her career and honestly she's helped yours. And that's where I'm going to leave that. It's just, and and it's just really silly that someone doing um, videos that you don't like or about, or in general, like someone doing videos about not, not liking the representation of women in, in games or not enough women in, in the industry or talking about it, that shouldn't rile you up that much. You should react like, well, I don't agree with it. I think the, the arguments are silly or baseless and just move the fuck on with your life. But you are known now because of her. You're, no, you're known because of her. You, you, 30 videos, buddy. 30 videos. All right. Next question is going to be about... Da, 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 da. When you were in high school, what career path were you looking into? Did that change in college? What about your major? Oh, Jesus. Uh, I started out as... Um, started out wanting to go into computer science since I was big at the time. Thankful I didn't stay with it because I sucked at... I sucked at... Um, calculus. Fucking sucked at it. <laughs> I fucking sucked at it. Uh, that's, that's a heavy one here. Uh, this will be the last question. I gotta get, I gotta get a fucking taco or something in my body. Uh, da, 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 da. The, the last question is going to be, uh, this is from, at, uh, at Yo Long Road Fox. The history of Pat and past perspective of his present and future role in gaming collecting culture, just spitballing. I don't know. I'm starting to get into preservation more. I'm tr- starting to become more of a producer behind the scenes of stuff. It kind of started with video game years. And me trying to get that going. And that was a, a problematic series for a couple of reasons. But I'm still proud of it. But now I got the book going out, going out there. Maybe a, maybe a certain SNES guidebook. Uh, there's a couple other ventures I'm going to get into behind the scenes. I'm coming on as executive producer of the Not For Resale documentary. You can you can support it on Indiegogo. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a documentary about uh, physical mom and pop retro video game stores and game preservation. And other things that might happen in the future. So um, that's what I'm doing there. The aging of the OG cool dudes. I don't know. Will, will I be doing Pat the NES Punk videos when I'm 55? Probably not. I'll, I might still be around. I might be still be writing and doing stuff. I might be still be doing this nice podcast. Might be still be doing that. So 
thank you all for listening to this Not So Common podcast. You can uh, support the Not So Common podcast by subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, or Podbean, or Google Play, or wherever you listen to them. Like, like and subscribe with the podcast there. Leave a comment. That all helps give it a boost there. If you want to directly support me in the Not So Common Podcast, I do have a Patreon. That's at patreon.com slash patcountry. And of course, I'm at Twitter and on YouTube, Pat the NES Punk. I'll see you next time in a couple of weeks. Hopefully, you got something out of this solo podcast. It's a little bit different. Um... I'll probably get into more politics maybe next time. We'll see if this if, if the Trump health care law, it's not really the Trump health care law, it's a GOP health care uh, law gets passed. And then I can go off on how, how our health care is fucked almost either way in this country because culturally we are not healthy and we do not have a good way of looking at uh, health holistically and wellness. A whole other conversation. So uh, I'll see you next time, guys. Hope you enjoyed.